This is July 12, uh, 1999, and Barbara Slavin at the Morse Institute Library doing a second interview with John in Ferrari. Uh, the first interview lasted about an hour and ten minutes, and we didn't nearly cover uh, as much as we'd like to cover, so we asked him back again. And it's good to be back. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Some of the questions I'm going to ask have to do with just the nuts and bolts of mm -hmm. the equipment and the weaponry, and the mm -hmm. others are really questions that sure. you've helped me with in terms of sure. what, what types of things that you think would like to be covered. Um, I know we talked about the Huey, but could mm -hmm. you just tell me uh, uh, what the... Elaborate on it? Elaborate on sure. the Huey, what it was and what well, it meant it, to it was a, it's, it's known as a utility aircraft, mm -hmm. a utility helicopter. Uh, its main role, of course, is to carry things, right. people, and things. Uh, and as I said before in our first hour, we, we carried nearly everything possible. As long as it could fit inside the doors, would carry it. Uh, it w would be used for, it w and of course it was um, tried out as a gunship as well. We had a, a, a version of it that only fired weapons. That's all mm -hmm. it did. Uh, we, we kind of customized a few of them over there too. To They had um, a, um, a team that would go out at night and look through what was called then a starlight scope and they would have uh, starlight missions and they would look for the enemy in the dark and that was the precursor to the night vision goggle. Um, we had other ships that would drop flares and would stack all the flares on board just like cordwood and they would circle overnight over, over an area and drop flares all night. Um, would carry I remember once we filled the thing with, with sporting goods, <laughs> uh, targets for archery and archery bows and arrows and uh, soccer balls, and, and that was all for the Koreans. <laughs> they were, that's their, their recreation. Uh, and uh, everything and anything that, that could be loaded on board would, would be loaded. Uh, and it was just a utilitary type of aircraft. It was uh, used for whatever, it, whatever anybody could come up with. It, its only limitations were our imagination, I guess. <laughs> so that's what, that was its main function. Uh, it was uh, being a, a turbine engined aircraft, it, it was able to lift a lot of weight, uh, but we always had to be bear in mind the amount of weight we were lifting uh, in an effort to get the thing off the ground because you could actually load more on board the aircraft than the aircraft could lift. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we had situations where our, our, our gunship version, which was a little bit smaller cabin, um, carried, a f carried a crew of four, but a lot of guns on it, machine guns, rockets, uh, grenade launchers, plus the two gunners out the doors. Uh, they'd have to run alongside the aircraft as it was sliding down the, the runway to try to get it off the ground. They'd actually do a running takeoff like it was an airplane. And this is a helicopter that has skids, not wheels. So um, they, they would do all sorts of stunts like that or, or try to even bounce it off the ground if they could get it, uh, anything, any way they get it in the air because they could carry many, much more in fuel and ammo than it can actually physically lift. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were always challenging the, uh, the aircraft. Could you, <clears throat> could you tell me more about what you mean by bouncing it off the ground? Well, they would, they would take it and, and actually get it in the air and uh, for a few seconds of where it would actually be airborne for a few seconds and, they, and it would come back down because it, they were, there weren't enough RPM to keep the thing flying because it was so much weight. Mm -hmm. They were beyond the weight limitations a little bit. <laughs> and uh, uh, they'd just start bouncing it and they'd get it to where it would stay airborne and then it would, they would very slowly creep away or, or dive off of a high place that had a drop off and gain some, some forward flying speed and, and off they'd go. Mm -hmm. So they'd actually go beyond the limitations of the aircraft to get them airborne. Uh, I didn't see it too often, but it did happen, where they were trying to get more than they should have taken. <laughs> you mentioned last week that, uh, not a couple of weeks ago, that you flew a slick. Yes. Could you tell me what that means? Well, uh, opposed, uh, unlike the gunship, the right. slick uh, was, a, was the workhorse uh, of the Hueys. That was the one that that carried all the cargo and supplies and troops and that sort of thing. And the name was derived from, I guess, from the idea that it didn't have guns hanging off the sides of the aircraft and it was more smooth looking, except for the two door guns. Uh, it was a slicker appearance, so less the name the slick. And that was the common, 
the common name for um, the Huey in Vietnam was a slick, at, at least that version. Yeah. Uh, the guns were generally called, they were called hogs most of the time, um, and they were, they kind of looked like a hog. They were kind of wide and fat and squatty because of the, all the things hanging off the sides of the aircraft. They, they looked, they kind of presented a kind of an ugly appearance, <laughs> <laughs> but deadly. <laughs> So that that was that was the main difference, uh, slick as opposed to hog, and and they uh, uh, other guys had other names for them, yeah. but they that was pretty much what was what was thought of as slick and a, and a gun. You know the the differences there. So when you flew the uh, troops uh, into combat areas, mm -hmm. did your did the helicopter always land, or did you have them jump out while you were sometimes hovering? we'd go to a hover, mm -hmm. we'd go to a. Um, a two or three foot hover, mm -hmm. and would have to have them jump out, right. um, and, uh, and oftentimes it was uh, <laughs> it was a little it got a little tricky because guys would be trying to get off the aircraft and they'd have a, a radio strapped to their back or they'd have these these huge knapsacks on their backs, you know, because it would be going off into the to wherever for for days on end without any resupply, and would have would be asking telling them to. You know, pointing out, you know, jump, you know, because <laughs> uh, we couldn't land. There wouldn't be any space, or it wouldn't be flat enough to to get the skids on the ground. And and um, and when we, uh, and sometimes if we were carrying the Koreans or we we're carrying the South Vietnamese troops, sometimes uh, they wouldn't understand English, so we'd have to start pushing <laughs> and anything to get out of there because uh, either time was of the essence or um, or. There was somebody shooting at you or whatever. You had to get, do what you had to do and get them out of the aircraft as soon as possible. And it was uh, sometimes it was a real challenge. But there, yes, there were times when we couldn't land. It might have been too muddy, yeah. or it might have been just a, a lot of times. As I mentioned in our first tape, we uh, carried on operations up in the mountains. Uh, we'd be at 5,000 feet and we'd be dropping these guys off on the, you know, on the side of a slope or some mm -hmm. such thing or or a wooded area where there wasn't enough real clearing to get all the way down in. and So yeah, there's, there were times where they'd have to do a little <laughs> bit of jumping. So, yeah, But that did happen, yeah. For the benefit yeah. of someone who's listening to the second tape first, where sure. were you stationed? Okay, uh, I was, where was uh, your base? My uh, primary duty station in South Vietnam was a place called Phan Thiet, right. spelled P-H-A-N-T-H-I-E-T. And uh, as I mentioned before, also in the first tape, it was the Nuuk Mom capital of South Vietnam, which is a fish sauce. <laughs> 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 and we, were, <laughs> if you if you saw the first tape, you'd understand what I was talking about. But it's but very pungent, uh, pungent odors. Pungent I odors, yes. Uh. <laughs> One thing uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, is that I believe you were in Vietnam when uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated? Is yes, we talked about that, yes, yeah. yes. And what was... Both, uh, both Martin Luther King right. and Senator Kennedy were both assassinated okay. the year I was over there. And how did that affect you and, and the fellow officers, fellow, fellow well, soldiers? Well, we all took it pretty right. pretty hard, and as I said in the first tape, uh, it was, uh, the, the, the blacks took it very hard when Martin Luther King was assassinated, because it was one of their, well, it was one of their heroes, and, and, mm -hmm. and rightly so. Uh, and um, again, when, when uh, Senator Kennedy was assassinated, the same thing. It was a, it was a very tough time. It was, it seemed like, the days were just a little darker. It, you know, being in a situation where you weren't, you know, uh, very happy to start with, getting news like that was not, not, not good. Yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of tough. Right. It, it was real tough. Right. Are there any other events at home that were? that you remember happening? Oh, gosh. Uh, I remember my dad writing to me, you know, and I, me I mentioned this again in the first mm -hmm. tape. Uh, he would write to me all the time. Uh, every day he wrote a letter. Mm -hmm. And he wrote to me and it's to say that um, one of his clients, it, my, both my mom and dad were hairdressers, mm -hmm. and one of his clients from Holliston uh, was the sister of the executive officer of my company. <laughs> so, so Major Thomas, my, my XO in my company, um, had a link with Holliston. He wasn't from there and had, I don't think he'd ever even been to Holliston, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, his sister lived there and, and his sister had went to see my dad to get her hair done. So there was a little link with home there and that was yeah. kind of interesting news yeah. to get. And of course I always had the, um, 
I always had the, the Natick Bulletin coming coming in and I was catching up with news at home, you know, that, um, and it was always, the news was always, well, let's see, who's joined the service this week? <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, just about every week I'd pick up the, the paper and it would be another face in the paper yeah. of someone that I knew that had gone into the service. And that was, but that was pretty much the way it went back in that period of time. You got to remember, the war was really cranked. Mm -hmm. We were at the peak of our involvement in that in the, that war, and there were only two choices, or well, actually three, if you want to count Canada. There was college, and there was the service, and there was Canada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, if you weren't in college, you were either in the service or waiting to go. Mm -hmm. uh, there were very few choices back then, so. The, News was always like, well, let's see, oh, so-and-so has gone off to the Air Force or the Marine Corps or the Army or whatever, and that's the, pretty much the way it went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One thing we didn't talk about enough last week was what your R&R um, &R was like. Oh, yes. What you guys did. Well, I was lucky. I was yeah. very lucky. I got a chance to go to uh, Taiwan, yeah. uh, and it was a, a week away from the war. R&R uh, &R stands for Rest and Recuperation. Uh, I originally tried to go to Hawaii because my my uncle and my seven first cousins live in Honolulu, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, what a great chance to finally meet them, and I nev I'd never ever met them. Still haven't met them to this day. <laughs> uh, still trying to get to Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I tried to go to Hawaii, but they wouldn't let me go because I wasn't married. Yeah. At the time, there were so many troops there that they limited the flights to Honolulu to just the married guys so they could visit right. their wives, which made a lot of sense, I understood. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I took a second choice and went to Taipei, which yeah. is a capital city, yeah. and went, w went off with um, uh, another uh, crew chief friend of mine, um, and we had a wonderful time. It was just terrific. Uh, our first night there, we decided, well, we got our rooms, and um, the first thing that happened was a guy came to the door and wanted to know if we, we wanted uh, to be fitted for new suits. Oh, they, so custom. we said, well, that, that's nice. It's only $30 for a, it was a suit jacket and two pairs of pants and three shirts and, and two ties for $30. <laughs> Seemed like a reasonable deal to me. <laughs> so uh, we decided, yeah, OK, yeah. all right. Yeah. So they, they sent another guy up, and they took our measurements, and, yeah. uh, and off they went. The next morning, I get a knock on the door, and Here's my suit, all made, perfectly fit. Just so here I am. I've, now I can be a tourist. I've got, I've got <laughs> clothes that I could wear, and I don't look like I just came out of the jungle. So, but I remember our our very first night there. We 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 got in a cab, and they, and the cabbie was going to take us to this, this big huge club. It was like a, um, uh, kind of like a Las Vegas style yeah. club with a with a floor show and and really good food and all that sort of thing. And so we got in the cab and we're driving down the street and, um, and we come to the intersection. He goes, oh, there's the, there it is right there. It was called the Hoover. Hoover, remember, it sounded just like Hoover Dam, you know. Yeah. This club was called the Hoover. And, and we just, just had to get through an intersection and we were there. And we got up halfway through the intersection and another cab cut us off. And, was, and they, neither of them were gonna budge. They were like nose to nose. And, Finally, they're yelling at each other in Chinese, you know, get out of the way, get out of the way. And, and, uh, and we're sitting there wondering, well, gee, you know, what's, you know, why don't why doesn't somebody do something? And the cabbie got out of the car, and, and now they're outside the car, and they're ye yelling at each other in Chinese. And, and we're sitting there, well, what do we do now? You know? And our cab driver, when we left them, our cab driver had the other cab driver over the hood of the car, and he's beating him up, and we just walked away. <laughs> Left them there, but that was an uh, amusing moment. It was just so. Uh, it was almost. I felt like I was in a movie, <laughs> but it was just so. It was so. Because uh, being a, di a uh, yet again different Asian country, different customs, uh, yeah. different uh, ways of thinking about things. Uh, uh, we we had. Oh, we probably had some of the best food mm. we'd had in months because it was all fresh. Uh, we decided we were going to go to a Jap Japanese restaurant and try something different. Yeah. So we, uh, we ordered sukiyaki, and it was wonderful. But sukiyaki, as you know, yeah. is a vegetable dish. I don't know if you've ever had it. Okay. It's wonderful yeah. with a little bit of meat and 
they give you a raw egg that you're supposed to dip all the uh, the vegetable in and eat it with. That's well, that's, that's the way they do it in in, in the Orient. Well, the next morning I was sick as a dog. Oh. Absolutely, just uh, I had and I developed a strep throat. So the rest of my seven days there, I was just at the worst. I could. It was the sickest I'd been in quite a while. Uh, I went off to the naval base there and saw an American doctor, and he gave me some uh, medication, gave me a shot, and then some medication to take throughout the rest of my trip. The rest of my trip was like I was in a fog. I so. I wasn't sure whether I saw this or that or, or what. Um, I can remember my friends coming to me and saying, we're going to go to this resort place out, up in the mountains. I'm going, well, aren't we supposed to stay in the city? <laughs> oh, no, we're gonna, you're going to love this. You're going to love this. So they put me on a train, and I, I'm just following along, trying to, trying to make a, a good time out of a not such a good time. And, and they put me on this train, and um, the porter comes by, and... and uh, he's filling up these little double glass things with water, hot water, and it's a like a um, a tea strainer, and there's a cup you pull out and you get fresh tea, fre nice fresh hot tea. And I thought, oh, this is just what I need. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, maybe it'll help me feel better. So we're drive driving along, and, and the, the tea drips all through, and it's all filled up. So I pull the thing out and I start drinking. It, and it was wonderful, just wonderful tea, probably the best tea I've ever had in my life, mm -hmm. and. Uh, <laughs> The strainer on these things was not that efficient, so you get a lot of tea leaves in your tea. So people are sipping and having a wonderful time. All these Chinese people are you know, going along on the train, sipping their tea, looking at the countryside, and everyone's got all these little black things all over their <laughs> tea. And they did like a, you know. And then I thought, well, this is all right. You know, this is okay. You know, I'm no different from them. And I remember some guy way down the train, some businessman had his, he had a nice three-piece suit on, and he got up and started to take his clothes off. I thought, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> well, it was an all-night trip from where we were in Taipei up into the mountains, and the guy had pajamas on underneath <laughs> his suit. He must have, it must have been a regular run for him because he yeah. was very comfortable taking his clothes off in the middle of the aisle in front of everyone <laughs> and with pajamas on underneath, and he stretched out on his seat and went to sleep. I thought, oh, this is casual. <laughs> Perhaps we should have done the same. I don't know. <laughs> but we went to this little tiny resort place called Tai Chung up in the middle of the mountains. And um, uh, when we got there, we, were, we, we got hotel rooms. And, um, and then we decided, well, it was, it was late in the day. We were going to go out and get some food. So we went into this restaurant. and uh, It was an Italian restaurant. And here we are, 500 miles south of Taipei, in the middle of Taiwan. Mm. And this, the most fantastic Italian food I've ever had in my life it was unbelievable. Maybe, perhaps, I don't know. Again, I, I had, I was sick. I wasn't really, a hundred percent there. <laughs> but it was just incredible food. I, just the best lasagna I'd ever had. Uh, we got back to our rooms and, um, and the, um, the girl, at, the girl at the that that ran the that was at the desk came to my came to my door and said, would you like to have a massage? I said, oh, okay, this, this would be interesting. She said, well, the girl will be right up. Yeah. And this, she leads this girl into the room. She's blind as a bat, okay, just totally blind. Mm -hmm. And it probably is what broke my fever because she um, walked all over my back and pounded, pounded my back and probably loosened up all the all the junk that was in my body and uh, the next day I got up and I felt like a million dollars I was you know I was breathing better and I was I was feeling better I wasn't uh, I think the fever was finally starting to break and I, I felt wonderful I thought oh maybe that's what I needed I don't know but I felt wonderful but anyway Taiwan was a great place it was terrific I I had a good time for what I remember of it yeah. a lot of it I was just in a, I was in a haze uh, I got. I was lucky enough to get a second R&R, &R, mm -hmm. which was in Australia. Our company commander uh, allowed us to go to Cameron Bay, which is about an hour away, an hour, an hour's flight away, um, and stand by for three days. Uh, and if we were able to get on any any flight anywhere within that three-day period, we could go on a second R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. Well, we got there and. 
Um, and the first day went by, no luck. The second day went by, no luck. And the third day came and I said, gee, I got to get out of here. There's got to be a way. So what they did was they had us sign a manifest and we would put our names down and the date that we entered country. Well, I, with a slip of the pen, I gave myself an extra year. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so instead of entering country in October of 67, I said October 66, put me right at the front of the list. So there was a flight going on to Sydney and I wanted to be on that flight. <laughs> so there was nothing between me and Sydney but a second lieutenant. <laughs> And he says, can I see your ID card? <laughs> Showed him my ID card and he goes, okay, have a nice trip. Oh. So off, here I am off to Sydney. And I had the best time. It was wonderful. The, some of the nicest people. Mm. I, I, my theory is that, that the Australians were still thanking us for World War II because we, we basically saved them uh, from disaster with the Japanese. Mm. And they couldn't have been nicer to us. They were just wonderful. Uh, I, I find it interesting that he, in, in downtown Sydney, and I, I've heard that it's still the same, that when you walk down the street, everyone says hello to you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you know somebody or not, whereas in this country, you pass someone on the street, you don't converse with them if you don't know them. Well, down there, everyone just says good morning to everyone else, you know, and it's, it's kind of a nice civil thing to do. I, I know, that was pretty nice. But uh, I, they had this, um, uh, this uh, the Servicemen's Wives Association, um, and this was the, um, the wives of all the servicemen that were stationed in Australia, in Sydney, um, set up a, uh, uh, a, a kind of a, like a rec recreation center in one of the hotels. Mm. So we could go there and we could sign up for all these activities. It was, it was great. So I signed up for everything. Mm. So I had, they, I signed up for a dinner, one evening with a uh, family. Um, I arranged to live with a family for uh, a couple of days. Um, they had a nightlife tour. Um, uh, I, they arranged for a date for me. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. And I, I tried everything and they were all experiences. Uh, the nightlife tour was probably the best because I, um, we went off to these different clubs to see how they, how, what it was like in, in Sydney. And lo and behold, the Everly Brothers are playing at this little tiny club that held about 200 people. And uh, the, the young lady that was taking the, the group of us around, it was about six or eight of us, uh, said, well, after the show, I'm gonna go backstage and see if they'll let you back here and you can talk with them. So she came back out and says, come on, boys, come on back. So we went back into this little tiny dressing room and got a chance to talk to Don and Phil. And it was wonderful because, it, you know, here's a, little, here's a little piece of Americana yeah. in, in Sydney, you know, and uh, he, but they both asked us where we're all from, and um, and I, of course, having played in a band, said, you know, I I play some of your material. <laughs> we did, you know, uh, I don't, I can't remember the was it, um, wake up little Susie and uh, one of their others. I can't remember the, all the tunes, but we, I remember playing a couple of them and telling them, oh, thank you, that's great. Oh, <laughs> glad you, glad that you do that sort of thing. That's great, and uh, and, and so they were wonderful and. Um, the next night we went off to see this other, uh, went to this other club, there was another guy playing there, another American performing, his name was Bobby Helms. And oh, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. I saw the name and I, I didn't recognize yeah. the name uh, until he started to perform and then he said, well, I, I know a lot of you folks probably never heard of me, but um, I had a big hit a number of years ago back in, the States, uh, it was called Jingle Bell Rock. I said, oh, yeah. that's the guy. Yeah. And um, You Are My Special Angel, that was his other big hit. So he had a couple of big hits. And uh, that, that was Bobby Helms, so I got to see Bobby Helms. <laughs> and uh, my date was, that wasn't so great. Um, I, sh I should have known better when I found out she, she worked at a lumber mill. <laughs> uh, she wasn't very attractive, but she was a very nice girl. Yeah. Very pleasant to talk to, uh, but she wasn't attractive at yeah. all. She wasn't. But anyway, we went to the club, and I, I took her to see the Everly Brothers again, mm -hmm. and she she liked that, and that, and that was good. Yeah. Uh, I stayed with a family, uh, and that was terrific because they had oh, they five or six children, and they all played instruments. Mm -hmm. And have, being a musician myself, I felt right at home, and I stayed with them for a few days. And uh, their oldest son played in a band and took me to a, a high school dance. <laughs> 
And so I could see his band play, and I sat in with his band, and it was wonderful. It was, it was just a great memory, just a great, great memory. And then um, one of the other gunners from my company who was down there with me uh, went off to a dinner one night. We, we were invited to a, a dinner at a house, and it was in a section of Sydney called Rose Bay. And all the Sydney Sydneyites call it Nose Bay because it's where all the upper crust lives. Oh. And we knew we had arrived when we pulled into this circular drive, and this is huge Victorian mansion. And a butler comes to the door and answers the door, and we tell them who we are. And oh yes, yes, you're the Yanks. Yes, uh, come right in. <laughs> and we came in, and now uh, it was. Uh, uh, I remember this huge fireplace with a roaring fire, and thinking, oh. They must know that we're freezing to death down here because it was, it was August, which is their winter, right. and we had come out of a tropical heat, and it was the first real warmth that we'd felt in the whole week because it was about, oh, it probably dropped down to about 70 degrees at night, mm -hmm. which was freezing to us. Uh, and during the day, it was probably up around, oh, probably in the 80s or so, which was not too bad. But a lot of the time, we were kind of cold there because it was, it was their winter. And uh, it was just wonderful. His huge fireplace going, and um, it was the home of Sir George Halliday. The the uh, he was the top eye, ear, nose, and throat specialist in Australia. Had been knighted by the Queen and um, a World War II vet himself. Uh, prisoner of war on uh, on Crete. Uh, so he had quite a colorful character, and. Uh, had had trained had trained uh, medically in, at Harvard Medical in Boston, so there was a link with Boston, which was mm -hmm. wonderful to talk with him. So he knew Boston, <laughs> which is kind of nice. Just a wonderful man, and uh, and we just had the nicest talk. One of the, I mean, it was just uh, just a night of luxury, just being offered a, a nice glass of port and uh, mm -hmm. and having a, a cigar after dinner and. <laughs> And just <laughs> living the life, you know, uh, for one night. It was just wonderful. Mm. But good, good people overall, though. Mm. Uh, one Sunday morning, we got into a cab and wanted to go to the park. And this, and so there were three of us in the cab, and, uh, and the gentleman, the cabbie said, well, would you like to go? Well, we want to go to the zoo. Uh, no, excuse me, we're going to the park. Uh, and he goes, well, where are you Yanks from? Uh, and I said, oh, I'm from Boston. And, so the guy goes, well, I'm for just outside of Hartford, and, and the other guy was from, I think, Detroit. And uh, he goes, oh, I'm from Akron, Ohio, myself, <laughs> in perfect, perfect uh, <laughs> Australian accent. <you> know? <laughs> Evidently, he had been a, a bomber pilot in World War II and loved Australia so much mm -hmm. after his visit there that he decided to stay and never went home. <laughs> so you just never know who you're going to run into. Uh, and you never could tell who's who. Uh, the very, very infectious uh, accent. Mm. The Australians are very, uh, I don't know, there's a very infectious. I felt, by the, by the end of the, my week there, I felt like I was starting to re-enunciate words mm. <laughs> different. Uh, but they're, again, very pleasant people, just wonderful people. So I really enjoyed my stay there. Uh, the last morning we were there, we, they, they had us all gather at this uh, the center in one of the hotels, and we were to take the bus from there to the airport and go back to Vietnam. And they had some sergeant come up and, and talk to us all and say, "Well, if any of you boys would like to stay another week, um, let us know." And everyone's going, "Oh, <laughs> why is he doing this?" You know? And then the other shoe dropped. He said, "Well, as all you have to do is um, extend your tour in Vietnam for another six months, and you can stay another week." <laughs> Now, to me, that seemed like, you know, I don't know. It just seemed like a dirty deal. So I, no one, no one took him up on it. But it was a dirty pool. Yeah. So I got back on the plane and went back. And um, when I got back there, that was the end of my time with my company. And uh, as I mentioned my, in the first tape, they split my company up into thirds, mm -hmm. and I went off to a place called Bami to it, mm -hmm. which is out by the Cambodian border. Okay. And that's where I met up with my friend Steve, who was from Framingham, and mm -hmm. that a whole thing. Oh, yes. uh, <laughs> so uh, aside but from R and R was R and R was a great thing. It was a you know a, a chance to see a little bit more of the world, yeah. and uh, and get away from uh, the fighting and and 
just to be able to see, you know, just relax mm -hmm. and, and uh, enjoy the world a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's what R&R &R was all about. Aside from official R&R, &R, when mm -hmm. you um, had time uh, on your base, what did, what did guys do for recreation? Oh gosh, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot to do. We had yeah. a game room, mm -hmm. uh, um, what we call a day room, and it had ping pong. We had a little, we had a soccer net set up, not a soccer net, um, excuse me, volleyball right. net set up. So we played volleyball in the evening sometimes. Uh, um, we tried to get a band together, but we couldn't quite get that going because uh, we couldn't get, get an electric guitar and we couldn't, mm -hmm. of course the power being off of generators was not quite right to do that sort of thing, so we, that didn't work out. But And we had movies every night, you know, we could see a movie. Uh, I can remember seeing, um, what was it, um, A Fistful of Dollars, Clint, East, Clint Eastward, and um, uh, A Few Dollars More, and yeah. uh, I remember we were stuck with uh, To Sir With Love, which oh, was yeah. a great movie, Sidney Poitier. We had it, I think, six nights in a row. By the end of the sixth night, it was like, we're all you know, mouthing the words. Lulu. You know? Lulu. Yeah, that's right, Lulu, yeah. A great movie, a yeah. terrific movie. I, I know all the dialogue. <laughs> I could fill it at anyone's part, but uh, after, you know that that was the uh, pretty much the as far as entertainment was concerned and and downtime. That's pretty much it. You know, yeah. letter writing took up a, a a fair amount of time too, and um, of course there was always something to do. Uh, uh, work on the helicopter, um, mm -hmm. uh, checking the guns, uh, uh, improving your positions, we, we always had sandbag details, filling up sandbags and that sort of thing. Um, so the uh, downtime was, oh, we would do little things like um, one of the guys had a popcorn machine, so we'd make popcorn. Yeah. And another guy had a hand crank ice cream machine. And we'd get the, we'd, we'd, I don't know how they did this, but we'd just about get the ice cream cranked into real ice cream and the pilots could, would come by and almost all, like almost like they knew when it was going to be ready. And, <laughs> with their hands out for, for ice cream. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was little, just little things like that. Yeah. Um, one of the guys found a, uh, came back one day with a, uh, a five pounder, that's a, um, a, a, an old muzzle loading cannon from an old sailing ship. And we set it up on the sandbags outside the, uh, mm. the tent and loaded it up with powder one <laughs> night to see if we could get it to fire. And, and of course it didn't, ex it didn't go boom, it just sort of smoked. <laughs> it just spewed all this acrid smoke out of the, out of the barrel. It was so funny. But little silly things mm. like that uh, would occupy our time. Uh, but uh, no, it was, a downtime was, uh, I don't know, it was, uh, you never really were down, per se. You know, the, you, you always had to be ready to move in a, in a moment's notice. Uh, and so it was really hard. I wanted to ask you, um, did you ever have a chance to meet the local people near your base? Oh yes, we had uh, civilian personnel that mm -hmm. would come on mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they were very friendly, mm -hmm. they're ni nice people. Yeah. Uh, we had what we called hooch maids. Yeah. Uh, when I was at my first duty station, we actually had a uh, barracks, if you will. We called them, they were called hooches over there. Yeah. And nothing more than a hut. Yeah. With, with beds in it, you know, yeah. with um, bunks. And we would have these maids come in and they would sweep the floor, yeah. they would uh, polish our, our extra boots, they would uh, do laundry and, you know, hang them out to dry. And so we didn't have to take care of that. And for a nominal fee, yeah. they would take care of all of our, um, our living area for us. And they were very nice, um, nice people. And I remember one day they, they were, I came in the mid middle of the day and and they were eating their lunch. And they had, they would come in with a little pail and, and they would have rice and maybe mm -hmm. some, a few vegetables or something and not a whole heck of a lot and they offered me their lunch. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, mm -hmm. these people are starving to death and they're mm -hmm. offering me their lunch. Mm -hmm. I felt like, God. So I took a little bit of rice and, and pretended to enjoy it. It was kind of tasteless actually, mm -hmm. it wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. But then I offered them some of my lunch. And they just eyes just lit up like, oh, this is a treat, you know. They, mm -hmm. I gave them some. Um, it was just nothing more than sea rations and, and some fresh bread out of the mess hall, and uh, they thought it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, they 
the, the people that we met up with were genuinely nice. They were f pretty much for us. Uh, every once in a while we'd get the, the occasional infiltrator from the other side, from the enemy, and they'd be uh, coming in to find out what, we're go what was going on inside the base, and they'd be marking off things and trying to figure out where things were so that when they came in, when they came time to attack the place, they would know where everything was. So there was the occasional infiltrator that would, they would catch with maps on them and that sort of thing. Uh, and what would they do uh, with them? It was hard to tell, it was hard to tell who the enemy without a scorecard. But uh, what would they do once they captured uh, Vietnam? Well, I, I don't know, I don't yeah. know. They would yeah. hold off to jail, I would right. suppose. Yeah. I, I don't know what they did with them. Uh, yeah. But we did catch one person uh, that, that, that had worked at the mess hall and Sure enough, they found her with a found her caught her with a map of the company area with all the buildings marked and right. everything paced off and you know uh, something like that would be very valuable to say um, a, a mortar crew that was going to try to lob some some mortar rounds in on the on our our base. So uh, that was one of the things we had to watch out for. But for the most part, the people that we met were very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked uh, a little bit with some of the Vietnamese military also. Uh, I left a couple of good friends over there that were in the Vietnamese army mm -hmm. as well and uh, they're good people, real, real nice people. Uh, so that was pretty much it. Uh, there was, uh, I mean day to day life, we would come up, we'd fly into places and uh, there were always children around. Uh, we'd fly in and we'd, um, the children would gather because they'd be looking for something. Mm. You know, to see just to see what was going on, just the normal curiosity, or to see if they could, you know, pick up some food here or there or whatever. And uh, one of the guys got the idea: to, well, let's let's get uh, let's fill up our extra ammo cans and we'll fill up with candy and we'll hand it out. And uh, so that that idea kind of caught on with the platoon, and everybody started carrying an ammo can, which is nothing more than a little metal box. Mm -hmm. And would you fill it up with with um, hard candies or mm. um, rolls of uh, lifesavers or whatever we could whatever we'd get, and uh, we got a lot of candy um, from our sundry packs, which is a basically a box of, of nece necessary items and uh, that was just given to us in the field because we didn't have a PX to go shop at. Yeah. Uh, the army would supply us with uh, razors and shaving cream and soap and. Um, s cartons of cigarettes uh, uh, and candy. Uh, well, the candy was—I mean, uh, it was—it was good candy, but uh, a little bit too rich to eat on a daily basis. Uh, after the diet that we're on, uh, it seemed like it was a little bit too rich. But the kids would love it. Yeah. So we carry these ammo cans around with us, and wherever we'd land, and if, if time allowed, we'd get out and and start handing out candy to all the kids. Uh, no matter where we went, there was always some, there were always a, at least a few, sometimes many, uh, depending on where we were, and would hand out candy to the, and they they just loved it. They they thought it was great. Well, one day we flew into this place, and it was a very particularly poor village. They didn't have a lot, and uh, the the children were, you know, thinner than the average, and they they seemed to be in tough shape. And we came out we came out the out of the helicopter with our can and started handing out candy to each one and they're grabbing, grabbing. You know, this is different. Mm -hmm. Usually they were very polite. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I know, the ammo can is out of my hands. It's gone. And they're all over the place oh. trying to get candy because they're hungry, not because they wanted a piece of candy. Yeah. Uh, that was kind of tough. I, oh. That made me feel really bad because they were, they were starving. Yeah. And, uh, but we'd always hand out the candy. We just kept it up. We'd play Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids loved it. They they seemed to like that, you know. For the again, for the most part, they were just looking to see what was going on or see if they could get a piece of candy. Oh. <laughs> could you tell me what Christmas was like for uh, you guys? That was kind of tough. Yeah. Christmas was tough. Uh, my my XO, my executive officer, had a was an organ player, and he brought his uh, little pump organ with him. This little tiny thing, it could have been more, much bigger than this, and, and he, um, he announced to the company that he was gonna, he was gonna after evening chow, he was gonna have Christmas carols at, I don't know, what was it, eight o'clock or something, in the mess hall. So anybody that wanted to come by and 
sing along with the Christmas crowds they could. So we decided to get out with a couple of friends of mine. We decided, well, let's go over and see what that's all about. And, um, and sure enough, he's there with his pump organ pumping away and playing, you know, jingle bells and uh, all these Christmas tunes. You know, it was great. And uh, uh, and he goes, well, let's wrap it up. We're gonna do we'll do Silent Night. So he starts sing, do, we'll start doing Silent Night. And there wasn't a dry eye in the house by the time he was through. And just as he's finishing the last chords, uh, some guy comes running through the mess hall, going, "Somebody's trying to steal our beer!" Because we had this, these pallets full of stacked high with cases of beer. The airborne started trying to steal our beer, so we all came, went running off to try to save our storage store of beer. <laughs> and that was the end of that. That kind of broke the uh, the moment. Uh, <laughs> it was just one of those things. But Christmas Eve was it was kind of, uh, we had a wonderful meal. The the uh, the mess hall. Gave us turkey and stuffing and all trimmings, the whole the whole nine yards. We had a great meal because um, everyone's pretending to have a great time, uh, yeah. but inside I was dying. You know, yeah. I just wanted to be in. I just wanted to be home. Right. You know, just like everyone else. Yeah. You know, it was tough. It was tough being away from home. One of the things you wanted me to ask you uh, mm. is, what was the summer of '67 like? Summer of '67. Well, I spent my I spent the summer of '67 in Kansas. Right. And that was, that was my training period with my unit before I went overseas. And Kansas was, ah, uh, it was such a different place from Natick. You know, it was so flat, um, but it was more of a, a chance to be more of a civilian than I had been prior to that time. Mm -hmm. And you know, was we'd do our, we'd have our normal duty day from eight to five, and then after. After five o'clock, we were free to do pretty much whatever mm -hmm. we wanted to do, and I had two great friends out there. <laughs> Oddly enough, their both last names were Anderson, and they both had cars, mm -hmm. so we were able to cruise, you know, uh, Manhattan, Kansas. <laughs> 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 we had the best time. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we knew we were probably going to end up overseas at some point. We didn't know when, mm -hmm. but we were going to make sure we had a great good time that summer. So we ended up. Manhattan, Kansas is the home of uh, Kansas State University, if, you, if you're not no, familiar not. with uh, yeah. Kansas at all. Um, and the, the town outside of Fort Riley, which is where we were stationed, was, was called um, Junction City, Kansas. <laughs> Charming place. Uh, um, the, uh, the countryside, again, as I said, was flat. It was a great place to go flying. And we joined, uh, we had a flying club on the field. Out, uh, aside from our helicopters, we had a yeah. flying club. So we uh, all started learning how to fly and uh, had, had just had a ball just flying over the countryside and uh, seeing all the different sites. And, and occasionally we'd, we'd get a weekend pass and go into Kansas City, which is about a, oh, 100, 150 miles away. Mm -hmm. And again, it was great. We just, I got to stand on uh, 12th Street and Vine, which is in the song Kansas City. And found that there was nothing there but two streets. <laughs> there was absolutely nothing there. It wasn't even in downtown. It was like on the outside of the city, and it was like nothing, <laughs> just a street corner. Um, but it was uh, again, Kansas City was fun too. It was, you know, there were movie houses to go to. There was uh, um, the huge park in downtown, and um, you couldn't get a bad steak in the whole city. It was mm -hmm. one good, really good Kansas City beef. <laughs> so it was a great place to go to go to dinner. And uh, so it was Kansas. Kansas was fun. The summer of '67, it was a great time. Um, you know, uh, as I said, once we were off duty during the day, uh, you know, once that was the duty day was over, we were civilians again. At least in our minds, we yeah. were. You know? So we got a chance to just kind of like be civilians a little bit and and not ha not think about the army for a while and and kind of enjoy the summer. So some. That summer, and it was it was a particularly hot summer as I remember. It was um, probably some of the hottest weather I'd ever seen, and that included my tour in South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It was uh, I, th I think that we had one day where we, we weren't allowed to work. Wow. Um, the the government called off all operations for the day because it was 106. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd never seen heat that that hot in mm -hmm. this country ever. I don't think I've ever seen it that hot. So it was a very hot summer. So, but we had a wonderful time out there. I remember listening to the very first 
eight track tape oh. uh, in my friend's car. We were listening to, um, oh, let's see, what was it? Uh, Sergeant Pepper's out, the Lonely Hearts Club Band. It was, we played that thing to death, every single song, just over and over and over again. <laughs> and it was wonderful. We had a, a great time. It was a, it was a, it was a happy time. Mm. Uh, really got to meld some friendships with uh, some of the guys I went overseas with and uh, just had a terrific time. It was, a, it was a, a good time in my life. Could you tell me something about some memorable people that you met in the service? Oh, gosh. Well, like my friend uh, Ron Anderson, he was, he was from, um, oh, where was he from? Glen Ellen, Illinois, which is a small community just north of Chicago. And he was just a real character. Uh, if we were in a movie, he would have been probably the leading role. <laughs> he was. Uh, um, he had the uh, he had the fastest car down there, so that made him king. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember him taking it out on the on the runway one night and drag racing with this other guy who had a Mustang. <laughs> he had a Chevelle, and the other guy had a Mustang, and they were going to prove that they were both going to prove that they had the fastest car, and <laughs> running right down the mm -hmm. runway. It, it, on the base there, you know, without even telling anybody, it was uh, it was it was quite a quite a time. But Ron Anderson, he was a great guy and, and a lot of fun. Um, his background, uh, like everyone else's that I met, a very similar background. They were the same age as me. Mm -hmm. They had similar stories to tell uh, about home life. Uh, the only the only difference was it was a different state, different town, uh, but the same stories. Uh, it was like we were one huge high school class, mm -hmm. but um, he was a great guy, a lot of a really uh, memorable person, uh, which I have since tried to find. And again, as I mentioned in my first tape, having a last name like Anderson, <laughs> um, Jefferson, uh, Miller, you know, Davis, that sort of thing, it's a t it's real tough to find someone with mm -hmm. names like that. Uh, they just tend to disappear very easily and uh, they, it, it's, you know, there's just too many of them out there yeah. to find them. So, but I had a, another great friend from Altoona and his name was Terry Anderson. Um, and yet again, a, 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 just a terrific guy and a lot of fun. We just had a lot of, a lot of laughs together. So that was, those are two of my closest friends. Um, and if I, gee, if I, if some of my other friends ever heard this, they'd say, well, how, what about me? Because <laughs> there were quite a few of them. I had quite a few mm -hmm. friends from that unit, and, and they were just so memorable. Too, too many to list. Right. You mentioned a voyage overseas. Was that your, uh, well, is it one of the you things know, that I, you... When I went overseas, I went by troop ship, right. unlike most, most of the GIs went over by, by airplane. Mm -hmm. There's just a flown over. And, uh, and what was that troop ship like? Well, it was the USS Walker, and mm -hmm. it uh, was a World War II troop transport. Okay. So it's, it was designed to carry troops. So there were 3,300 of us on board, and uh, it was one of the. We were, we were part of the last real big buildup mm -hmm. uh, of the war. Uh, there were several other troop ships that were making the same voyage um, uh, to build up the troop levels. Mm -hmm. uh, because they couldn't fly us over fast enough. They, so they loaded up these ships and um, shipped us over. So uh, we, we went overseas by troop ship. We left Oakland Army Terminal mm -hmm. and right past Alcatraz, right under the Golden Gate Bridge, off into the sunset, just like a John Wayne movie. Uh. <laughs> and I uh, remember the first hour, about a third of the, the passengers were on the rail, <laughs> sick as dogs. <laughs> and I, I've never ever gotten seasick. I don't know what it's like, but I, that, I understand it's not fun. Yeah. But um, I always remember that, and, it, and I can remember they they took all of our weapons away and, and put them in storage because we didn't need them for one, uh -huh. and for two we could have you know lost them. And it, they let all of the officers keep their sidearms. And I remember seeing this gentleman on the rail. Few few people down from me sitting there talking with another pilot. He was uh, they were both pilots, mm -hmm. not in my unit, but mm -hmm. someone some other unit. And he's sitting there just standing on with his arms over the rail, twirling his gun, his his pistol. I'm thinking, boy, that's not a good thing to do. <laughs> and sure enough, a minute or two later, it slipped out of his hands and off 
Um, <laughs> We're an hour outside of San Francisco. Dude. This guy's already lost his weapon, <laughs> his sidearm, <laughs> into the ocean. <laughs> Is it all okay? That, that's why they let the officers keep their weapons so they can lose them. <laughs> <laughs> but the voyage over was uh, it was really something. I um, they assigned me a bunk and I and they said, "Oh, you're a deck six, uh, bunk six. Well, deck six and bunk six put me uh, at the lowest hold in the ship uh -huh. and the bottom bunk of the lowest hold. Uh -huh. So I was as far down into the ship as I could get." Couldn't get any further oh, down, yeah. which I understand now was a plus for me because when you're at the closest to the keel, there's less rocking. Maybe. The further up you oh, go, the more yeah. rocking there is. So I wasn't even aware of anything, um, any movement to speak of uh, when I was in my bunk. Uh, the only, on the downside, though, because of the ventilation, you know, I'm six decks below. And it, that's a long ways for the air to get to, to you. So every morning I could remember waking up with this really dry throat and I'd climb up six decks to get to the <laughs> outside so I could breathe some real air. And gosh, we'd go day after day after day uh, with nothing, just seeing nothing but ocean mm. all day long, nothing but ocean. And uh, I remember one morning we got up and I looked out and there's this island, it's like those this little piece of island like you see in, in cartoons. There's a little thing sticking out of the water with, with one tree in the middle of it sticking up. I think, oh, gee, I could swim to that. <laughs> you know? And they probably wouldn't miss me for, for weeks, you know. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a long voyage. Yeah. Gee, it took us, uh, well, it was long for me. Yeah. Uh, it was 21 days nice. from Oakland to um, our first stop, which is in, well, actually, we stopped overnight one night in uh, the Philippines, mm -hmm. in uh, Subic Bay, for um, I guess they, I don't know, they were refueling or some some such thing. I'm not sure what, but they let us off the ship for a couple of hours, mm -hmm. and uh, I only had, I only had a few dollars. I had something like nine dollars on me because I missed payday getting back to Fort Riley, and they mm -hmm. had already closed up the pay record, so they couldn't pay me. So I was going to go off to, oh, that was another story. I, I went off, I went on the ship, on board ship with a dollar in my pocket. I got into a poker game one day thinking, well, maybe I could, I'm either going to lose this dollar or I'm going to make a few dollars. And I, uh, I got in the poker game and I won nine dollars and then I walked away. <laughs> I thought, okay, this is good. You know, this will hold me over. So we got to Subic Bay and uh, I went off to this club just outside the, uh, right off the dock in uh, um, a big club called the China Seas and thought, oh, this is great, I'm going to... So I, I ordered a cheeseburger and fries, just like an American, you know, not thinking to order exotic, I, I'm going to go with a cheeseburger and fries. So I got that and then ordered a beer and had a beer and then thought, well, maybe I ought to order something exotic. So I, I ordered a, a zombie. I've never ever had a zombie <laughs> in my entire life, but I was going to order, I was going to try something different. So I had this drink and it tasted great. Yeah. By the time I finished it, I couldn't feel my legs. I, I had no feeling whatsoever. Because <laughs> being a young kid, I, I you know, Al, I was never, I've never ever been a big drinker, but yeah. uh, being a young kid, I wasn't used to it at all either. So uh, it just about killed me. You know? <laughs> and so I went back to the ship having spent all my money and there's guys coming on just absolutely plastered. They're carrying them up <laughs> over the shoulders uh, onto the, and one guy showed up with a, a complete Australian Navy uniform on. <laughs> had traded clothes with some Australian Navy guy and uh, had to convince them that he was really on this ship and that he was really thus and such, not what he looked like. So that was Subic Bay. And then, of course, off, the next morning we're off again and everyone's on the rail again because they're all hung over and sick. And then we had to skirt south. We had to go south uh, because it was a typhoon in uh, during uh, on, on in our path. So we had to go south of where we were supposed to go, and mm -hmm. and just skirted the outside of this thing. And, and it was the most humbling experience I have ever encountered. Because that big 400-foot ship was being tossed about like a little cork in a bathtub, mm -hmm. 
Uh, it was just incredible. The waves were, uh, they would just blot out the horizon. Just huge, huge waves. Um, so that was really, that was an interesting trip. Um, just recently, uh, in my last um, duty assignment, which was uh, three weeks ago, I, I met up with a sergeant major who was also in the same aviation brigade that I was, um, had shipped out also on that same ship with me 30 some odd years ago. We just found out, just met the guy and just through coincidence, we found out that we were on, on that same ship because he, I said, I, uh, I left in October and he says, I did too. And I, I said, oh, I was on the walker. Oh, I was too. And I said, well, what major event happened during that trip? Well, we kind of like went through a, uh, a typhoon. Oh, that was the same ship. We were on the same ship. So it's kind of an interesting little thing there. But uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a voyage. That was uh, my first real taste of sea duty, if, yeah. if you will, for an army person. Uh, but that was 21 days over. And uh, we stopped in a place called Quinon, which is another coastal city, and then went south to Cameron Bay, which is the main, um, the main facility there. It had the, the largest uh, docking facilities mm -hmm. in, the, in the country. We got on a plane from there and flew to our... Uh, our duty station, which was which was Fu Hip, mm -hmm. which I mentioned in the first yeah. tape, yeah. and um, so that was the voyage over. That was oh, that was interesting. I knew then that I, I uh, that the Navy was not the right choice for me. <laughs> <laughs> Spending 21 days at sea was not fun. Uh, it was different. It was interesting, but I wouldn't call it fun. <laughs> Do you remember what you when you were on the ship, what you thought the war would be like? Oh gosh, um, you know the chaplain would come in and give talks to us and say, "Well, you know, don't go creating any monsters in your mind about what's going to happen to you or what's going to go on." Uh, and of course, everyone did. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you you th you think one thing and it's never right. Mm -hmm. It's just never right. Um, a lot of guys were saying, "Well, gee, you know, well, I, my brother was over there and he said it was this way and that way," and, and it's never right. You, you never, you never visualize what it actually is. Mm. And to me, it was like, a, you know, I, I kept thinking the worst. Well, of course, I, you know, on the voyage over again, alluding to the, the voyage over, I had very little to do but read, you know, or write letters or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I read what was it? Um, what was it? Who? Oh, I'm trying to think of the author. Uh, a Walk in the Sun. It was a World War II novel. Oh yeah. Uh, I have that. I've forgotten. The I can't remember yeah. the author, but yeah. um, here I am wearing a World War II infantry yeah. story, you know, fictitious yeah. story about yeah. Italy. And uh, it was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, well, gee, is it going to be like this? And I said, no. Mm. And, it, and again, it wasn't. It wasn't anything like that. Mm. Uh, it was, it, I guess every war has its own flavor, its own feel, yeah. its, its own course. It takes its own course. And I don't think they're ever the same mm. as as far back as I can remember. I mean, the, the Revolution certainly wasn't like the Civil War. Yeah. The Civil War certainly wasn't like um, the Spanish-American War or, mm -hmm. or even World War I. They were all different. They all had their own nuances, their own, its own flavor, if you will. Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't really know what to expect because it wasn't, um, I'd never been in a war before and I, you know, I, so I didn't really, I knew that at some point and sometime over the course of the next year, Someone was going to try to kill me. Right. <laughs> so, my 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 best thoughts were, well, gee, well, maybe we'll we'll get to a quiet place and not a lot will happen. <laughs> but you just never knew. It was a kind of a it was a kind of a war where sometimes you know several days would go on go by and nothing would happen. Absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. It was just sheer boredom. Uh, and then. All hell would break loose, and you'd think, "Well, okay, this is, I guess, this is the way it's going to go." And that, and that pretty much was the way it went. Uh, a lot of times, just nothing ever happened. So it was kind of that was pretty much the way it went. Um, but you never knew what you're going to be doing next, and that, that was the way it went. Is there anything else about your 
army life in Vietnam that you'd like to bring up? Coffee. Oh, that's my favorite subject. I tell this story because yeah. I, I love coffee yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, when I went to Vietnam, I was I hated coffee, I hated coffee, and wouldn't touch the stuff. Uh, I was somewhere near the end of my tour. Uh, I know that I was I was in Van Mituat, which is the last three months I spent over there, mm -hmm. and I drew guard, guard duty one night, and here I am sitting there, and I I drew the 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 graveyard shift, which was like from one in the morning to three in the morning, the worst possible time of the night to try to stay awake. Mm -hmm. And well, you also have to realize it's been, you know, the better part of the year. I'm already over there already. And I'm really kind of worn down. I don't know it. I don't realize it, mm -hmm. but I'm worn down yeah. and kind of worn down. And um, so I pull the shift. And I, I get up on top of the bunker with my rifle, and I'm sitting there, and it's very comfortable. It's probably a, a very cool 75 to 80 degrees um, and very pleasant night com you know just stars from horizon to horizon mm -hmm. beautiful night absolutely gorgeous and I'm sitting there with my head back against the sandbag relaxed just staying awake looking around just looking for anything that's out of the unusual and uh, and I'm just eventually just started to drop off to sleep which is you know it's a court martial offense mm -hmm. You, know, you, you stay awake on guard duty for a reason, and that's to keep everybody else alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started to drift off, and then I, and just the last moment, just as I dropped off, I noticed there was a jeep coming. And it was the sergeant of the guard checking all the guard posts. So I got up. I wasn't fully asleep, but I was getting there. Yeah. And I came to, uh, you know, and realized, oh, geez, I almost fell asleep, and I can't let that happen again. So uh, the next time I drew guard duty, I said, well, I've got to do something about this. So I, um, I said, well, I've got to drink some coffee. That, that'll keep me awake. And they didn't have, as I remember it, they didn't have any milk or cream or whatever. Nothing to soften the blow. Mm -hmm. So I just loaded it up with sugar. I had a cup of coffee and six sugars. <laughs> and thinking, well, if at least if it's sweet, maybe I can get it down. And, mm -hmm. I don't know, the sugar probably kept me awake more than the caffeine did, but mm -hmm. I, I just downed it, not really liking it at all. And, but found that it worked very well. Of course, never having had that much caffeine, I, I was bouncing off the walls the first time <laughs> I had it and, uh, and found that it worked very well. So uh, that's what I would do. That would be my routine. If I had to stay awake at night or if I was um, called on to work at night, which we were sometimes asked to do, uh, I'd have a cup of coffee and I'd stay wide awake. Yeah. And uh, so I get back to my, back to the States here and I got signed to my next duty station in Virginia and uh, lo and behold in this office they have a coffee machine. I said, well, hmm, I wonder what it tastes like with milk in it. <laughs> Maybe it'll taste better. So uh, sure enough I had a cup of coffee and I put, I went down to three sugars. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is okay, yeah. this is all right. And, and then found after a couple of months that I could get by with two. Mm -hmm. um, and about a, I don't know, about a year or two ago, I went down to one. And now I can even drink coffee without any sugar. So I, <laughs> I feel like I've made progress, but uh, that's how I started drinking coffee. And that was the funny, th one little funny thing about Vietnam is that if I hadn't gone there, I never would have ever learned how to drink coffee. <laughs> of course, now I'm addicted to it. <laughs> Did you smoke in Vietnam? Everybody smoked. Right. Everybody, yeah. It was it, if you were in the army, you smoked right. cigarettes. Right. You know, it was just the thing to do. Um, and, but oddly enough, I didn't. I I smoked up until about. Oh gosh, let me see. I seventy one or I don't know seventy two. I quit, right. um, and I was up to about a pack and a half a day, right. and I, I just stopped liking them. I I just no, it wasn't for me. Right. So um, yes, I yeah I smoked right along with everyone else and. Because it was free too, they they gave us free cigarettes. So, uh, uh, but no, I, I gave it up. It wasn't it wasn't for me. <laughs> We're jumping ahead to your re uh, turn to the United States from Vietnam. How did you return home? Did you fly? Yes, yes, and and that was another another thing. I thought, yeah. oh, this uh, another great chance to visit my cousins, yeah. because there were two major air routes out of Vietnam. Uh, one was. Uh, 
uh, at least from where I was, Cameron Bay was the departure point. Yeah. It was Cameron Bay to Honolulu to San Francisco. And the other air route was Cameron Bay to Yokota, Japan, <laughs> to uh, Seattle, Washington. Yeah. And of course, I didn't get to go to Hawaii again, but I got to see Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so we flew out uh, um, out of Cameron Bay, and I can remember when the wheels left the ground, everybody broke into a, into a cheer <laughs> and applaud. And, uh, and it was just wonderful just to leave the ground and, and, and to be going home. And I remember uh, getting off the plane in Seattle and a bunch of guys were getting off the plane and kissing the ground and that sort of, you know, that sort of thing. And, and it was about, oh, it was about midnight, one o'clock in the morning, something like that. And they, they shuttled us all off in a bus to um, Fort Lewis, Washington, which was right nearby. And all night long, they processed us back into the country. That, that yeah. took all night. And they, they had us, um, they refitted us for brand new dress green uniforms and, um, and they had us, uh, they went through all our baggage to make sure we didn't have any contraband or any live weapons or anything that was going to hurt anybody. And yeah. they, uh, they debriefed us, asked, asked us all a bunch of questions about where we were and what we saw and that sort of thing, uh, a security thing. Right. And um, pretty much, you know, they did give us a quick physical to see if it was any, any ailments, that sort of thing. And um, pretty much packaged us up and got us ready to go home the next day. So at 6 a.m., we were free to go. So um, got back on a bus, back to Seattle, uh, uh, what is it, Seattle, Tacoma, Washington Airport, and uh, caught the first plane to Boston. Uh, well, my sister, my sister mentioned that she, well, gee, you know, you're in Seattle, you could have gone to Honolulu, you know, at that point, because I, I had a month's leave uh, ahead of me. Uh, but I was just, I, I couldn't wait to get back to Natick and see that common and be home. <laughs> so uh, I got in the first plane back to Boston. I can remember after being in the air for, let's see, what was it, 26 hours, then Seattle, and then, no, it was 26 hours total of t travel time. Uh, we got somewhere over about, oh, well, the middle of the country, somewhere in the, um, and the flight attendants came by with champagne for all, all the vets that were on board. And I didn't, you know, I I didn't know whether I wanted breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or, <laughs> but boy, that, that champagne it, it tasted good. But I di I didn't know what time of day it was. It could have been could have been any time of the day. I just didn't. I it was so turned around as far as time yeah. time zones. Uh, I got, I remember landing and and a couple of a couple of my friends that were with me um, overseas were still with me uh, getting off in Boston because I lived nearby, one guy from New Bedford and another guy from Fall River. And their families were there to meet them. I thought, oh no, I can't do this. You know, it was just too emotional. Mm -hmm. I was like, no. Yeah. Uh, so I got in a cab, I snuck back into town in a cab and uh, went to uh, a friend's house and, um, and she had a car and she took me around to another, fr uh, one of my best friend's house mm -hmm. and got to visit with him. And then I said, I gotta get downtown. I gotta see the common. <laughs> then, I, then I can call it home. Yeah. Then I can then I can go home. And so she's okay, and she's looking at me like, all right, <laughs> all right. So we came down and looking at the common. Okay, all right, time to go home. So I, so she drove me to to my parents' house and and my aunt and uncle just happened to be leaving. My uh, uh, my mother's brother. Uh, they they were just leaving the house as I pulled in the yard and and they're going. They're looking, say, who's that? You know, when I got out of the car, and of course it was, that was the homecoming I was looking for. Yeah. That's the kind of homecoming that most GIs um, experienced when they came home. Yeah. Other, you know, rather than the band playing right. the, the the victorious march down Main Street, whatever it was, that was the homecoming that everybody wanted and wanted to see, and that was wonderful. That was that was great. So that was that was coming home. That was the uh, the voyage home, and and I remember the next what was it that. That evening, my mom had, my mom had saved a steak for me. She was going to cook me a big steak, and, I, and of course, having having lived off of um, a reduced um, reduced fare for such a long time, I don't think I even got halfway through that steak. I was I was stuffed. 
because you, your, your stomach tends to shrink in hot weather. You don't need to eat quite as, as heavy, but oh, God, it was so good to be home. <laughs> that was the best, one of the best memories, yeah. was just coming home. Oh, and what is your, what have, what have you done career-wise and well, life-wise in general well, in the, uh, um, since Vietnam? Well, I, as I said, well, I got out of the Army. I, I, when I got home from Vietnam, I still had time to serve in the military. Right. I was reassigned to um, Fort Eustis, Virginia, to the transportation school, which is the school I went through for my helicopter training. Mm -hmm. And so I, f I filled out my career, finished out my career down there, and um, uh, got out of the Army in August of 69. And, and just as through sheer timing, or whatever, I don't know. The, the school that I wanted to go to, uh, East Coast Aerotech, mm -hmm. which I went to, uh, the, the, op the, the next available date was the day after I got, I got out of the Army. So here I am sitting in class, first day of school, and my ears are still plugged up from the plane flight home from the Army. Uh, big mistake, <laughs> big mistake. Uh, I probably should have taken a month or two just to, yeah. to recharge my batteries. Yeah. Because uh, I ended up, uh, let's see, that was August. By Thanksgiving, I was um, just about as sick as I could be. I was, I had the worst case of mononucleosis my doctor had ever seen. <laughs> he said, I, I was, he almost put me in the hospital. It was that bad. I had, uh, I it was just, I was just run down. Uh, and that altered my career yet again, mm -hmm. because I never went back to school. I just, I found that I, I just didn't have the drive. Mm -hmm. I was all worn out. So that, that ended that career, um, which was aviation maintenance, uh, and went on to, oh gosh, a number of jobs before I settled on my final career. Uh, but I, I was a musician for a year. I worked in a gift store. I, did, uh, I was a taxi cab driver. <laughs> I, I did all kinds of odds and ends in different things trying to find my way. But I ended up uh, going to hairdressing school and becoming a hairdresser. Now, having a mother and dad, a mom and dad were hairdressers, and they had a shop here in town, and everyone assumed, well, gee, your mom and dad must have talked to you in the, the, that career, right? and, and as it turned out, it, they didn't. <laughs> I ran into a guy at a club once when I, was, when I was playing in a band who was a hairdresser, and he had a Cadillac, mm -hmm. he had new clothes all the time, you know, he had all this money. I thought, oh, okay, I guess maybe this is a good career. So I thought I'd give it a try. And, um, so I was a hairdresser. I've been I was a hairdresser for 25 years. Did that, and just uh, recently, within the last couple of years, uh, gave that up uh, as a full-time career. And now I just um, I just um, um, what I want to call um, I don't have a shop anymore. I just uh, I just do it on the side, and mm -hmm. um, I have a house cleaning business now that I do, mm -hmm. and I still fly with the Army Guard. On a regular basis, so that kind of that's kind of like taken over part of my my work schedule. So back into the military. Right. Are you in the reserves? <laughs> so it's Army National Guard. Army National Guard. Yeah. As opposed to the Army Reserve, which okay. is a component of the regular Army. So you Army National Guard. Army National full -time? Guard. Part time. Part time. Part time. Okay. A lot of the guys that are full timers mm -hmm. think that I'm full time because I put so much time in there. <laughs> But it's it's another paycheck. Yeah. You know, it's just another way to make dollars. Yeah. So that's how it's all come about. I've I've kind of come full full circle mm -hmm. with my um, my aviation career, and I'm back at the end of my um, my chosen aircraft's uh, lifespan. I'm, yeah. I'm there to usher them out, I guess. Uh, probably within the next couple of years, will they'll probably be retiring the last of them. As I said earlier, that they're getting old. Yeah. You know, they're approaching 30 years old, um, and the Army is replacing the Huey with the Black Hawk, right. which is the the sec next generation of aircraft. Uh, we've got a couple of new pilots that just got out of flight school, and they trained on something other than the Huey, mm -hmm. and went off to Black Hawk school. So they're they're already out of the Huey loop, so to speak because it's too old. Mm -hmm. So the, the new generation has already started. Mm -hmm. And um, it takes a while because, I mean, the, the Black Hawks have been in service now for, oh gosh, um, since the late 70s, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
uh, quite a while, and but now they've reached the point where they're even in the National Guard. They're they're becoming commonplace, and uh, and the Hueys are very slowly working their way out of the system. So mm -hmm. I'll be there to usher them out. Oh. <laughs> the last crew chief with the last Huey, uh, I guess. <laughs> you said something so. at the first interview, and I'd like you to say it again. You are the mm -hmm. last. Yes, uh, I'm the well, last. I want to get it down Viet right. The last Vietnam crew chief. Right. Uh, still crewing a Huey mm -hmm. in the state of Massachusetts. Right. Still on flight status, yeah. Uh, so as long as my health holds up, I another know. two years I'll, I'll probably call it quits in it, and I'll close the door, turn out the lights behind yeah. me. <laughs> is there anything, before we close the interview, is there anything sure. else you'd like to share with me about oh, the gosh. Vietnam experience? Oh gosh, oh my. Um, it or was... any words of wisdom you'd like to impart? <laughs> I, oh boy. Uh, uh, do we have another hour? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Uh, other than the, the, the close of the last interview, I, I mentioned, you know, if we could ever end it and not have another war, that would be uh, great. I don't think that's going to happen, but um, as was the case in, in for me and for a lot of other guys in this town, in the town of Natick, uh, I hope that uh, if they have to go off to do their duty and, and um, do what they have to do, Mm -hmm. and hope they return in one piece like I did. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time and for your sharing all your experiences with us. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you.